much bigger hole than that. Oregon grapefruit. Oh, yeah. That is? Looks like it. But it's no. Oh. No, it's yeah. in the middle. Yeah. It's all See? big metal. Like, One big metal. Awesome. <laughs> it kind of sounds like a fairy term. Uh, the phrase. I haven't really heard about it much really until like 2009 started. It feels like something that everybody is catching on to, but it feels like it's that balance between, it's that balance between the forest, the forest and the farm is really what it's all about. So I think the one big problem that happened in the way beginning is when people were just chopping down the forest for agriculture and stuff, but really you can keep it how it is and still grow food and live off the land. Washington State as a whole holds a really big piece of, you know, myself. Everything from holidays and celebrations to the family outings to, you know, hiking around Mount Rainier and it's like sometimes you just gotta stake a claim and pick an area and a piece of land that you really care about and put some energy into it. So, my name's Natalie Peruz and I am a graduate student here at Evergreen and the sustainability coordinator with residential and dining services. And um, one project that I wanted to work on while I was in tenure here was putting in an edible forest garden. And there's this awesome space that we were able to work with. It wasn't being utilized otherwise because um, it wouldn't grow grass and there was this real interest in growing grass here, but it wouldn't grow because it's too shady. And so they were like, here you go. Why don't you work this space and develop it however you can? So instead of just like coming out to space and saying, I want to put these plants in here, we came out to this space and said, okay, there's alders here, there's cedars here, there's maples here. And I thought that bringing more food into residential spaces um, could only be a win-win situation because it ties students in with their place and kind of creates a sense of place. It um, brings a connection between students and, and their food and also provides an opportunity to learn about the land and um, the plants that can grow here. And um, in all that, in working together, working across like with classes and students living in sustainability housing and other residents living on campus and other campus community members, um, it was just a really good opportunity to network and create a sense of community between all those groups. It's raising people's uh, awareness about local food yeah, and about what's in their like area. Well, just having been here this morning, a number of people have stopped by and asked what's going on. About what they can eat in their own backyards. And, you know, a lot of people probably don't know what edible forest gardens are, don't know much about them. Like, I know in concept what they are, but I've never seen one. And the Northwest is an amazing spot because yeah. all these plants are growing now and will continue to grow through the winter. Um, and so it's cool to kind of see this happen and this isn't a really visible place where people are going to continue to be curious about it and probably imbibe in, in the fruits of our labor, if you will, um, and make people more excited about it. You know, many of these people shop at the co-op or you know don't have meal plans or um, are looking to grow their own food or get in touch with some better food and that food really is the way that a lot of people get introduced into sustainability. And I think this bioregion is um, particularly unique because it's so in your face. I'm from the Midwest where it's flat and there's a lot of farming and there's a lot of industry and that's here. But like you can't build those things on the mountains and so people seem a lot more connected to their place here and aware that it's special and it's something to be preserved or remembered. Who would have thought that we'd be able to just dig up a plot 
and start putting stuff down, you know, it's pretty cool. My own head, I just came away with that going, oh my God, I wanna plant all these perennial plants and it just makes so much more sense. It's lower maintenance, it's easier, it lasts a long time, you put it in once and it just proliferates. Um, so trying out this, this new, newer sort of concept was something I really wanted to do. And it was something I'd really only read about and not actually necessarily seen in action. On April 9th, 2009, um, students from Food, Place, and Culture, a full-time program, came to begin installing the garden space. They focused on the native species because they were looking into a lot of ethnobotany of our area. We used cardboard and wood chips as part of our strategy to take over the landscape here. And this does a couple of different things. Um, it's really great for weed suppression. Cardboard also allows for uh, mycelium to run through it and the corrugation in it really encourages them to just like go. And as those mushrooms break down or break down the cardboard, they're also really helping out the soil and they're making connections between the roots of the different plants. The third thing that cardboard really helps out with is keeping the soil moisture um, in the ground. It's still intact even on these really hot days. So forest gardening can be, can actually occur in a variety of ecosystems. And um, we were working within, you know, a Pacific Northwest, um, kind of early succession sort of forest model where we have some, you know, decent sized alders and a couple of good sized maples, um, a number of different things. And that was one thing that we looked at was what kind of pattern are you working within? And we're working within like a partially deciduous, partially coniferous um, forest and planting into that forest. So when we're doing our plant selections, we looked at all these different limitations that were imposed by the amount of shade that's here, the problems with drainage, and the soils that we had to work with. And instead of just choosing the plants that we wanted, we looked at what plants would fit best within these requirements. Because I wasn't going to start cutting down the trees to create more light, and I wasn't going to truck in a bunch of soil. Besides the fact that it seemed like a lot of extra work, it just... I think that there's a a lot to be said for working within the ecosystem that you've been given instead of the way that so many people just think of where we live and the planet that we're on right now. They're just like, oh, I don't like this. And here, let's just scrape it and put something on top of it. It's like, no, what, what's here that, that we can look to take from? What, what is there that's being offered? And how do we work with what's being offered already? It's all kind of in human terms, isn't it? Like invasive, aggressive. This plant evolved to come in where soil was disturbed and cover the soil and propagate easily and quickly when something's been torn up after a hurricane or a bulldozer. So like it comes in that it's doing its job, it gets in there quick, and it's only invasive because we're like, ah, oh, it's too much, I don't want it. But it's not invasive, and if you eat it, then it's really not invasive. It's like spinach.